Hello, everyone. Uh, I am excited to welcome you tonight to the Climate and Workers' Rights uh, Forum. We're going to be talking about the farm worker overtime bill for the uh, short session, uh, the 2021 short session. I'm going to take a quick second here to share my screen. And There we go. Um, I would, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of our uh, hosts for today. Uh, the Oregon Environmental Council, uh, of course, OLCV is where I work. I'm Julia DeGraw. I'm the coalition director there. Um, Pekun, who is one of the leaders on this legislation, uh, Climate Solutions, and the Oregon uh, chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, thank you all so much for pulling this uh, event together and thanks everyone for coming out here uh, for the event. Uh, even if it is virtual. Um, I wanted to start off uh, by doing a land acknowledgement. Uh, the Oregon League of Conservation Voters works to protect people and the places of, on the ancestral lands of the indigenous communities who built homes, economies, and trading routes across the land we now call Oregon. We would like to honor and acknowledge Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. The Klamath tribe of the Southern Oregon Plateau, the Burns Paiute of the High Desert East, the Coquille of Southern Oregon's coastal forests, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde in the Northern Coast Range, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua in the Southern Oregon foothills, the Confederated Tribe of Umatilla in the Blue Mountains, the Confederated Tribes of Silets in the Oregon's Northern Rainforests, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla on the windblown Southern Coast, and the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs on the sunny eastern slopes of the Oregon Cascades. And we would like to recognize all the other indigenous communities who have not been federally recognized. Oregon was built on broken treaties. The lasting effects of federal and state policies, both past and present, have put Native lands and Native Americans at disadvantage for hundreds of years. It is on all of us, whether we are descendants of colonizers or inhabitants of stone land, to re-educate ourselves and each other. Together, we have the responsibility to push past recognition and demand land reparation and uh, reparation and repatriation and reparations to sovereign tribal nations and indigenous people across the state. OLCB aims to work in partnership with tribes to further this endeavor of land rep uh, repatriation and reparations. Uh, and moving on to the agenda, um, this is uh, the agenda for the day. We are going to hear from uh, Representative Andrea Salinas, who is championing this bill and has championed many important priorities uh, over her uh, years in the Oregon State Legislature. Uh, we are going to be hearing uh, from uh, a couple of other speakers from the environmental movement. We have someone coming in from the Sierra Club and the Oregon Environmental Council. And they'll be hearing from folks at Pucun uh, about the farm worker overtime bill, getting more details about the bill. Then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, throughout the event, you can drop uh, your questions in the chat and we will do our best to get to all of them. Um, and also have uh, folks be able to ask them out loud uh, during that Q&A section. And then we'll um, let you all know what you can do to help out to get this bill across the finish line in the 2022 uh, session and have a, a training at the very end for how to participate in testimony writing. Um, and just real quick uh, on Zoom, uh, uh, we just recommend that you use that chat function to interact with us. And um, I think that's it. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our champion of this bill, Representative Andrea Salinas. Thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy day to be with us today and uh, tell us about this bill. Great, thank you so much, Julia. So, um, and thank you everyone who joined us um, here today. Since March, 2020, Oregonians in every corner of the state have suffered through endless challenges from the pandemic to catastrophic wildfires to a record breaking heat wave. No community has been left unscathed, but Oregon's farm worker community has been hit exceptionally hard. Many workplaces were able to shift to remote work during the early days of the pandemic. Farm workers could not because of the essential in-person nature of their work. When public health experts advised Oregonians to stay inside to avoid breathing hazardous levels of wildfire smoke, farm workers were in the fields working tirelessly to harvest crops. And when temperatures reached record highs during June's heat wave, 
farm workers push through 100 plus degree temperatures to complete their grueling work. And as I think many of you read, we lost some lives due to this type of work and these grueling conditions. So no matter the circumstances and no matter the risks that have come along with the work, farm workers continued to show up for Oregonians, even if it meant putting their own health and safety at stake. But despite repeated sacrifices, farm workers still don't earn overtime wages because of federal labor laws. Well, Oregon can change that. And we are here today to make things right with House Bill 4002, the Farm Worker Overtime Bill. We started this journey last year when I introduced a bill to require overtime pay to our farm workers, and we continue that fight today. When Congress considered the Fair Labor Standards Act, a landmark policy which introduced overtime pay, established the minimum wage, and banned child labor back in 1938, farm workers were initially meant to be included, but they were removed from the bill in order to obtain the votes of Southern lawmakers. At the time, the South relied on the exploitation of black labor in agriculture and Southern legislators feared that if these laws were extended to farm workers, they wouldn't be able to continue the racist and segregated labor structure their economy relied on. The history books show that these congressmen were pretty explicit in their testimony that this exclusion was about race and it's, it's in the public record. Um, and I won't go into some of the comments that were made. The exclusion applied to farm workers of all colors, but its purpose was to perpetuate a Southern labor system that had its roots in slavery. And sadly, we continue to face the effects of this exclusion today as most farm workers are immigrants from Latin America. Excluding farm workers from overtime was wrong in 1938, and it's still wrong today. And while Oregonians today don't bear the responsibility for the decisions of our predecessors, we are responsible for how we want to move forward. It's incumbent on us and on this legislature to right this historic wrong, require farm workers be paid overtime, and move Oregon towards the just and inclusive place we want it to be. So I'm here today. I'm honored to champion farm worker overtime again this year, and we'll work hard to make sure that we pass it in 2022. Farm workers are essential. Time and time again, farm workers have shown up for Oregonians. Now it's time we show up for them. Thank you so much for being here today and for helping in this fight. I just realized I was muted, everybody. Welcome to Zoom land. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Representative Salinas, for, for your words and for all of your um, hard work on this incredibly important piece of legislation. Uh, we really appreciate you. And thank you again for taking the time to be here today. Um, the next slide is not showing up, there it is. Uh, next, we're going to be hearing from uh, Vir Virginia Tarango, who is presenting on behalf of the Oregon Chapter Sierra Club uh, to talk about ways in which um, Sierra Club and environmental groups have been working together for farm worker rights for a while now and immigrant rights. Um, without further ado, please turn on your video and, uh, and join us, Virginia. Well, thank you, Julia. Um, it's great to be here with uh, everyone tonight. I'm so glad to see everyone on at this event. Um, my name is Virginia. I'm a volunteer with Sierra Club. And uh, tonight I'm gonna go over some of Sierra Club's problematic history as an environmental organization in terms of, of uh, how some of our leaders have looked at immigration. Um, I also wanna discuss how we've been working to understand and acknowledge the harm that we've done. And I also wanna go over some examples as Julia mentioned about how Sierra Club is showing up on immigrant uh, rights more currently. Um, so next slide, please. So as a Sierra Club member, I feel like it's really important to share what I've learned about our club, our club and our past leaders. So this slide, this history doesn't define me, um, is, is really important. And as um, Representative Salinas was saying, it's where we go from there. So um, uh, this isn't new information uh, about um, some of uh, Sierra Club's past. 
um, the organization itself has published articles examining and acknowledging our past and how it's contributed to anti-immigrant sentiments. So, um, so just a little bit about the club and the history. Um, in 1849, John Muir's family uh, immigrated to the US um, from Scotland. And in 1849, he founded this, the Sierra Club. Um, he is known to have made comments um, depicting indigenous peoples and uh, black people in a derogatory manner. Additionally, early me members of the Sierra Club's board included leaders who held white supremacy and eugenics views. Um, in 1998, some within the Sierra Club, including the gentleman that you see pictured in this slide, John Tanton, um, he's considered the uh, father of the anti-immigrant movement. They pushed uh, for Sierra Club to use its influence to promote policies that blocked immigration and to undermine immigrant rights. Uh, they wanted Sierra Club to become an anti-immigrant organization. Um, this was put to a vote and the membership voted it down. Um, in 2004, there was another attempt by anti-immigrant advocates to take control of Sierra Club's board of directors. So um, what I mean to highlight by bringing this up is that there are a number of issues overlapping ideologies about uh, population control, eugenics, and conservation um, that existed then and still exist today. Um, and um, some will seek to greenwash their racist or anti-immigrant views as protection of the environment. And still others will fail to see how immigrant rights is tied to environmental issues. So um, we see, I wanna point out an example from um, 2018 uh, when um, the Oregonians for Im Immigration Reform, OFER, um, got ballot measure 105 onto the November ballot. Um, and then just as an aside, the Southern Poverty Law Center has designated OFER as a hate group. And if we can go to the next slide. So we have two measures that we, um, that I want to spotlight. One is Measure 105. This ballot initiative sought to overturn the state's sanctuary law, um, which limits the cooperation between law enforcement and the uh, federal uh, immigration enforcement or ICE. Um, Sierra Club, so at that time, and this is a pretty momentous thing um, for Sierra Club anyway, is um, we got to work with Hoel Iboa uh, um, from CAUSA and to start up the environmental uh, committee for the One Oregon Coalition. And they convened with other environmental organizations like the Oregon League, League of Conservation Voters for, um, with um, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Audubon and Climate Solutions. And they organized their members and environmentalists to um, show up and vote no on Measure 105. This was followed uh, between, so that was on the November 2018 ballot and then um, in the 2019 legislative session, um, we see House Bill 2015. House Bill 2015 was the Equal Access to Roads Act. Um, this eliminated the requirement that applicants must provide um, proof of legal status. So you know, a US birth record or a passport uh, before you could receive a um, driver's license or a driver's permit or an ID card. So what we recognize is that um, when you make things like driving your kids to work or going to driving to see the doctor or just trying to get to work, when that is illegal because you don't have a driver's license, and then you have these interactions with local um, law enforcement that then can turn into um, encounters with ICE. These are all things that are meant to make people less secure. Um, and it's a way to oppress people. So how is that an environmental issue? So we know that the impacts of climate change are causing droughts, they're causing flooding in areas that used to produce food. We also know that sea level rise is getting rid of land mass. We're losing land mass. So ultimately this means that more humans 
will be forced to migrate from their homelands to areas that allow them to survive. Um, the impact of climate change, um, it affects everyone, but we know that it disproportionately, you guys hear this all the time, it disproportionately affects more, um, some people more than others. So and we also need to remember that the US is the second largest contributor, contributor to uh, the climate crisis. People with more economic means tend to have a bigger carbon footprint. So we need to address this global issue. But immigration is not the cause of climate change. It is a result of climate-induced disasters. It is, it is the result of uh, systemic racism and socioeconomic disparities that concentrate power and, and wealth in a way that makes us all more vulnerable. So our collective future hinges on everyone having the, what they need and to have the, their, their rights protected. And certainly a government that treats anyone inequitably is not good for any of us. So we can solve this crisis by working together. Can we go to the next slide? So the harsh reality is transition is inevitable. We're gonna to have to deal with the climate crisis, but justice isn't. So we need to intentionally incorporate environmental justice into our work. And this movement is visionary. Uh, it creates a world that it will maintain the health and the well-being of all living things. And that's the goal. Next slide, please. So we recognize this. We recognize that uh, just transition, that environmental justice is what we need to be doing. Uh, I've been an active member of Sierra Club for about six years, and I'm happy that this that the Sierra Club is an organization that's working to take on its responsibility to engage these issues and to partner with others uh, against anti-immigrant policies and a host of other issues. Together, we win. We win big, and we win big for everyone. So um, thank you so much for this time to share share. Um, how uh, the environmental organizations are working collaboratively to make positive change. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that history. I think it's really important for us to understand uh, where we're coming from in order, in order to understand how to move forward uh, differently and, and with intention. So thank you so much for that background. Um, and next, uh, we're going to be hearing from Nora After from the Oregon Environmental Council to continue uh, the presentation. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everybody. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here today to speak to the importance of this issue um, and specifically to the power of climate and worker advocates working together. Um, as environmental advocates, which I know we have many on the call, we're all too aware of the science that tells us we must take urgent action to reduce fossil fuel emissions and address climate change. Um, but as people living in Oregon, we don't have to be scientists to know that the impacts of climate change are already here. We've all seen and experienced firsthand the devastating and deadly climate-fueled wildfires and extreme heat that have ravaged our state in recent summers. And I want everybody to think about the sun beating down during the hottest hours of the heat dome last summer, or the thick wall of smoke outside your window during the worst days of the September 2020 wildfire events. Now think about being outside, doing arduous labor for hours on end in those dangerous and extreme temperature and smoke conditions. For thousands of Oregon farm workers, that is their reality. Our farm workers are really on the front lines of the climate crisis and bear the brunt of these impacts. But as we've heard, they remain one of the lowest paid workers um, in the country. And it really cannot be overstated. The risk of these climate hazards is severe. Exposure to wildfire smoke and excessive heat have serious lasting health implications, including increased risk of respiratory and cardiovascular disease, kidney failure, heat stroke, or even death. And as many of us are, are well aware, just last summer, extreme heat killed a migrant farm worker named Sebastio, Sebastian Francisco Perez, who died alone while laying irrigation pipes at a farm in St. Paul, Oregon. 
Yet Sebastian was not the only fatality from extreme heat last summer. And in addition to the um, over 100 deaths in Oregon due to heat illness and the hundreds more emergency room visits, there were 254 complaints submitted to Oregon OSHA just between June 24th and June 28th and just for excessive heat exposure alone. So the disproportionate harm that our farm worker community has faced while for working to feed Oregon families is unconscionable, unacceptable, and it is also entirely preventable. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So recognizing uh, the need for a concerted effort to achieve more equitable health, health outcomes for Oregon communities, Cocoon and uh, my organization, Oregon Environmental Council, came together in 2020 to form what we call the OCAP Health Table. And for those not familiar with that acronym, OCAP is short for the Oregon Climate Action Plan. So since that time, we have worked together with dozens of other climate, environmental justice, worker protection, youth, and public health partners to advocate for lasting equitable public health and climate outcomes through the implementation of Governor Brown's Executive Order on Climate, or OCAP. And thanks to the strong partnership of Cocoon and OEC and our many other valued partners at the OCAP Health Table and beyond, we have made some really incredible progress to increase public knowledge and awareness of the public health impacts of climate change in Oregon and advance policies to protect human health and mitigate climate change impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, so significantly, OEC and Pacoon have worked hand in hand over the last year to advance strong standards to protect workers from wildfire smoke and extreme heat. Um, so this time, timeline here highlights some really major events in this year long campaign, but What's not pictured here are the countless stakeholder conversations, briefings, letters, and rulemaking meetings that our organizations and our coalition have engaged tirelessly in and which have led to some re really remarkable progress. Um, notably spurred in part by the death of Sebastian, as well as pressure from Cocoon, OEC, Northwest Workers Justice Project, and again, many, many other partners Oregon OSHA made great strides this past summer by enacting emergency rules to protect workers from climate-fueled excessive heat and smoke. These are the strongest such rules in the country. And what they do is require simple common sense protections like providing access to shade and cold drinking water, or when temperatures spike above certain extremes, um, additional measures kick in such as increased breaks and active monitoring for heat illness. OEC, Pacoon, and our partner organizations have continued to push Oregon OSHA to adopt strong permanent protections for workers. And we are really hopeful that those rules will be finalized and adopted this spring. Um, it's also worth noting these efforts are making an impact on the national scale. The Biden administration and Department of Labor have taken some new protective measures to, um, to protect workers from the hazards of extreme heat. And we're also making headway in the legislature where we're working with Rep. Alonzo Leon to pass a resolution that we hope will pave the way for future legislative action to protect workers from these climate extremes and ensure no worker is faced with the decision to choose between their health and their paycheck. Um, so I'm talking about this campaign because I think it's really important to emphasize that our success has um, been really based on the broad um, and diverse coalition of organizations engaging at every step of this process with Pakun and, and OEC um, at the helm. But I also want to be clear, the OCAP health table and this heat and smoke rulemaking process um, are by no means the, the beginning of OEC and Pakun's partnership. Pakun has been an invaluable partner to OEC and the broader environmental community for years, well beyond mine and Ira's time as co-leads of the OCAP Health Table. Pakun was a core partner for the Clean Energy Jobs Campaign. They helped to direct campaign strategy and ensure strong climate and community outcomes. 
They hosted coalition meetings, inspired crowds at rallies, turned out members and youth on lobby days, and time and time again, Ira and his colleagues have showed up to provide compelling testimony in support of climate protections. So now is the time to show up for our frontline workers by supporting their push for overtime wages. And with that, I will turn it to Ira. Thanks, Nora, and, and thanks everyone for being here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Ira Cuyo Martinez. I am the policy manager at Begun, Oregon's Farm Worker Union, based here in Woodburn, Oregon. Uh, and today um, we are having this forum to make the connections between farm worker rights uh, and, and climate uh, and environment being um, involved in how, how farm workers intersect with these issues. Um, and I think one of the first things I, I wanted to bring up um, with regards to farm workers and, and the environment is that farm workers have, have been facing a lot of these issues for, for many years now. Um, and you, the most relevant um, thing that comes to mind with regards to climate justice and environmental justice is that farm workers have been exposed to toxic pesticides for, for many decades now um, just to increase production and, and harvest season. Um, but at the expense of not only the land, water, and air, but also farm workers and their health and human life are, are being at risk uh, when exposed to these hazardous uh, toxic pesticides. Um, and in, in addition to these pesticides, um, the other issue that we've seen emerging over the last years uh, and intensifying over the last few years is, as Nora mentioned, the excessive heat and the wildfire smoke that's present in, in the fields and in different workplaces for farm workers. Uh, that's an area where um, we know that it's only gonna get worse uh, and it's being fueled by climate change from uh, all the different uh, pollution that's coming from, from corporations and other entities. Um, so now we, as a state, have a responsibility to ensure farm workers are um, earning strong wages and ensuring that we limit the exposure to hazardous conditions like the smoke, like the excessive heat, um, toxic pesticides, and then and numerous other um, uh, hazards that they face on the job place. Uh, so that's how I wanted to open up today's conversation and, and how we're making these connections between um, climate, environment, and workers' rights is, is the fact that these farm workers are, are our frontline workers and they're essential workers. Um, yet they're not being treated as as equally as every other worker. Um, and we're hoping the that the environment and climate community uh, can come support our our efforts to to make some changes for for the farm workers um, in the state of Oregon. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, I just want to highlight the issue that we have at hand that that farm workers are prioritizing for the 2022 legislative session. Um, and the simple fact is that farm workers are excluded from overtime pay. Um, most workers in Oregon um, are, re are already receiving overtime pay, which is 1.5 times regular pay after every hour worked after 40 hours in a work week. Um, I think overtimes are really a really general and um, well-known concept that every worker has uh, either benefited from or has heard about. Um, however, the overtime rules are different for some workers and, and people who work in different capacities, including in government agencies, in hospitals, in canneries, and factories. However, within with regards to agricultural labor, it is completely excluded and they don't have any guarantees of receiving overtime benefits, even after working uh, after uh, 40 hours in the work week. Um, and this is impacting about 87,000 farm workers in Oregon who are all excluded from overtime pay. Um, and the majority of these workers are seasonal farm workers who remain in the state year round. Um, and uh, about 30% of these folks are, are migrant farm workers who are coming from California, Washington, other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Um, and so that's just wanted to give uh, um, some context around uh, the issue and, and how many farm workers are being impacted by, by this exclusion. We can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, and uh, Representative Salinas uh, touched on this already, um, but this there, there's a history and legacy of exclusion when it comes to farm workers and, and workers' rights. Um, so I just want to remind folks that the reason overtime laws were established in the first place was to reduce the risk of injury and burnout for workers um, as they continue to work excessive hours uh, um, and beyond a reasonable limit. Uh, many public health experts um, have have noted the impacts that overtime has on on workers and on on human health, um, and and the reason that it was created was to mitigate the amount of uh, of excessive work um, people were going through, um, and the these overtime laws were created through the Federal Labor Standards Act of 1938. However, there was an exclusion of two particular types of workers through the act. Um, the first is farm workers, who, which we're looking to change today, and the second of which is, is domestic workers. These uh, both uh, class of workers have been excluded from overtime pay, as well as minimum wage and child labor regulations. Uh, and this all stems from Jim Crow era, Jim Crow era white supremacy and, and wanting to maintain this um, this hierarchical structure based on race um, that, again, legislators in the past were um, uh, sharing their testimonies in, in public comment uh, and in public hearings, and it's and they're really direct and explicit when it comes to the reason and behind wanting to exclude farm workers and domestic workers from, from these basic guarantees. Um, and so we know that the demographics of farm workers have changed over the years, um, and you know, while the Fair, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act um, was created in an era where the majority of farm workers were African American and Black farm workers, uh, now we've seen that the majority of farm workers have shifted uh, to being immigrants from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, regardless of the shift in demographic, we know that excluding farm workers from overtime pay was wrong in 1938. Uh, and it continues to be wrong today, and so that is why we are looking to to shift this exclude to end this exclusion uh, and ensure farm workers are paid equitably for for the job that they do. Can go to the next slide, please. And um, I also wanted to talk about what overtime pay means to farm workers. Um, so what impacts will this have on farm workers, their families, and, and community members? Um, and first and foremost, I want to highlight that this would bring equality and justice to the farm worker community. They would receive the same gar overtime guarantees as every other worker by ending a racist exclusion of farm workers. Uh, and, and they would get um, something that they, they should have been included from the start. Um, so that's making sure that they're on equal uh, level field as, as every other worker. Um, and, and, and ending this exclusion of, of Jim Crow era. The second thing I wanted to highlight for you all is the health and well-being aspect of, of overtime to farm workers. Um, if, if overtime pay were to pass, this would also achieve better health outcomes for farm workers so that they're not working excessive hours or being exposed to the hazardous climate conditions that we've mentioned before. Um, so this is uh, really where a lot of the uh, um, intersections with climate and environment comes in because we know that climate change is, is happening and only getting worse. Um, and the climate conditions that we've been seeing um, is, is intensifying for farm workers and we cannot, cannot continue uh, allowing workers to put themselves at risk when it comes to heat waves, when it comes to wildfires or wildfire smoke winter storms and even heavy rainfall, we've heard many farm workers share um, uh, negative experiences um, from slipping on ladders to uh, not being able to see clearly when, when harvesting the crops. So there are a lot of conditions that, that impact farm workers and, and overtime pay is just another way to help it limit the exposure that they have to, to those hazardous conditions. The next thing I wanted to uh, highlight for you all is around the quality of life for farm workers. Um, so overtime pay would allow farm workers to have more time in their week so that they can spend with their family, take care of other responsibilities, or just be able to rest uh, and not have to spend their whole week uh, in, in the fields. Um, and just for folks to be aware, um, farm workers uh, during a harvest season is oftentimes working 
more than 58, 60, even 65 hours in a week. So they have very little time to go back home, uh, um, eat their eat their dinner and get ready for the next day and, and begin work very early in the morning. Uh, and the reason that we need to um, pass over time is so that they can have some of their time back while also being compensated fairly for hours worked after after 40. And then the last thing um, is, is pretty straightforward, um, is around economic stability. Farm workers will earn more income to support themselves and their families if over time uh, pay passes in the 2022 legislative session. Next slide, please. So uh, the solution that we have to end this um, uh, racist exclusion of, of farm workers from overtime pay um, is HB 4002. Um, and um, just wanted to do some background and history around how this uh, policy came to be. Um, and so in 2019, um, the hosts an annual convention where members come uh, to talk about different uh, priorities, concerns, issues that they're seeing within the community. Um, and they get to vote on our political agenda as Big Boon around what priorities that we want to have for upcoming legislative sessions. Um, and in this annual convention is where uh, members were sharing that they were seeing some uh, changes with regards to overtime laws in California and that farms were beginning to pay overtime um, and were implementing that in in the state of California and we're wondering what's the situation looking like in Oregon and how we can change that to ensure farm workers also get overtime pay um, in our state. Um, and so after doing research and preparation for the next year, um, in 2021, we introduced farm worker overtime bill. Um, and unfortunately, the bill did not pass during the 2021 legislative session. However, we are coming back in 2022 to reintroduce the policy uh, and it's uh, currently um, known as HB 4002, which is being led by Representative Holvey. And as you heard, Representative Salinas, who is our champion on the, on the policy. Um, this is their proposal to help us achieve overtime pay to farm workers. And there are three main components of the policy um, that you should all be aware of. The first is that um, the overtime law would, uh, the overtime policy would apply to both workers who are paid at an hourly rate or by piece rate. These are workers who are paid either by the bucket or by the pound or by the amount of um, uh, produce that they, they pick and harvest. Uh, so both of these workers would receive overtime wages under this policy, and it will be a five year transition period into achieving overtime pay at a 40 hour threshold. Um, and this is uh, this is something very difficult for us as advocates, as as farm worker advocates, to um, to see because we we believe farm workers deserve overtime immediately. Um, we don't think farm workers should have to wait five years to receive a uh, to receive a basic um, right that every other worker already receives. Um, and so that's that is something hard that for us as advocates we've seen and are are hopeful that we can get there at a at a faster rate. Um, but as it stands right now, that's what the, the proposal and the policy says. Um, and in addition to the five-year transition period, there is also a tax credit that will be available to growers during that transition period so that they can uh, pay farm workers overtime wages when they're exceeding 40 hours in a work week. Um, so those are the three pieces of the policy that I wanted to share uh, with you all today. Um, and um, with regards to farm worker overtime in HB um, 4002. Um, and, I, and that's uh, all that I have for my presentation. We welcome uh, questions that folks have um, in, in the chat box. Um, and if you also wanna raise your hand and we can take questions verbally as well. Thank you, Ira, for all of that background. It's super helpful. We do have a lot of great questions in chat. And I know that um, Greer um, from Climate Solutions, uh, Greer Ryan, has been tracking those. So she's going to help uh, kind of uh, shepherd this uh, Q&A section. Yeah, thanks, Julia. Um, it's so great to hear all of those presentations. Um, I've been trying to track the questions and some of them have been answered, but um, we've got a stream of good ones coming in. Uh, I'll start with 
the first that I think hasn't been answered yet, which is if there are any stats about how much overtime farm workers are or were working. Could you, could you repeat that question one more time, Greer? Yes. Um, are there any stats about how much overtime farm workers are or were working? Uh, so as it currently stands, we, we don't have um, exact stats around how many um, overtime hours farm workers are working and not getting paid. Um, that is an area where there is a lack of information and we've reached out to, to the Department of Employment and other agencies to see if we can get a better sense of um, that data specifically, but we, we currently don't have um, a number at, on hand. And if we want to go to the next slide, Julia. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, Sarah. Um, the next question was, uh, how will this bill limit exposure to heat waves and other excessive hazardous conditions like smoke? Overtime pay is essential, but seems unrelated to limiting exposure. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think um, when it comes in regards to um, exposure to excessive heat or wildfire smoke, um, farm workers oftentimes don't have an option or a choice to go to work or not. And the reason being is they can't afford to miss a day of work. Um, and so when there is wildfire smoke present, for instance, in, in September 2020's wildfire season, we saw wildfire smoke present in all parts of the state. And, and farm workers continue to labor in those hazardous conditions. And farm workers are aware that these have a negative impact on their health and on their well being. And on the same time, they don't have another choice but to be there in order to pay for rent, groceries, utilities, uh, child care, and other expenses that they have in their family and, and for themselves. Um, so that's the reason as to if overtime laws were to be passed. Um, this would give farm workers more income and uh, take home wages. And at the same time, they wouldn't have to, to be working the extended hours that they do, given that they would be earning similar uh, rates or wages um, from less hours worked. Thanks, Ira. Um, I think there are a few questions that are somewhat related to each other. So I'm going to try to group them, um, which are what are some of the biggest hurdles uh, to overcome in order to get this bill passed? As well as what are the reasons this didn't pass in 2021? What, what was the opposition stance? It seems unconscionable to resist this. I know the reason was cost of business, but really that can't be justified to exploit workers, right? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and uh, really what it comes down to is um, there, there are um, several legislators who are supportive of the concept of overtime and ending this um, uh, racist exclusion. Um, however, um, they are also concerned around the impacts it may have on, on um, small farms and family farms. Um, and they are concerned around the farms in their specific districts that may feel the impacts of, of farm worker or of overtime paid to farm workers. Um, and you know, we all something I, I didn't mention in my presentation is that both uh, California and Washington um, have passed overtime laws in their states. Um, and California is currently in their fifth or sixth year of implementing overtime, and Washington's in their first year. Um, but we haven't seen the um, the impacts that that many industry folks are are sharing um, with legislators around. Um, that they can't afford to pay overtime wages, that this will decimate their economy and their business, and they wouldn't be able to stay afloat. We haven't seen that impact happen in or in Washington or California, and we don't anticipate it happening here in Oregon. Uh, in fact, we think it's uh, really important for um, Oregon to to pass this um, policy to ensure uh, that workers are remaining within the state and not having a further labor shortage when it comes to farm work because that's something we've also heard from industry, from farmers and ranchers, that there isn't enough farm workers. Uh, and if overtime laws, if overtime is being provided in California and in Washington, um, they will be less incentivized to come back to Oregon if they earn a higher income in, in other states. Thanks, Ira. Um, I think that somewhat relates to another question. Um, 
And so if you don't have anything to add to this, that's fine. But uh, what can we learn from the California implementation of overtime pay for farm workers to help advocate for HB 4002? I think um, what we're learning right now is uh, we we really got to center our message around um, the health, the well-being, and the uh, equality of this policy. Um, we know that uh, industry and farmers and growers are always going to circle back into the economic arguments as to why we should not pass farm worker overtime. Um, but this really is about equality. It's really about justice. It's really about um, the health and well-being of farm workers. And so. I think that's something that we've been learning from our partners, partners both in California and in Washington, uh, that they um, have shared with us to make a successful campaign in, in passing overtime laws. Um, and um, the other pieces of it is um, that we we're learning from them is around this uh, economic support that Oregon is offering that isn't offered in California and it's not offered in um, in in Washington either. Um, and so Oregon is actually going a step further by, by providing this economic support for, for industry. Awesome. Um, a few just details about the bill, detail questions. One is uh, how would this transition work over five years? And I, it relates to another question, which is, is there a tax credit there to incentivize farmers to pay farm workers overtime during the five-year transition period? And does it end after five years? So um, I, I, yeah, so with regard to the five-year transition, um, so within the first two years of transition, farm workers would be receiving overtime pay after 55 hours. Um, and so that's uh, what the first two years would look like. Years three and four, farm workers would start receiving overtime pay after 48 hours. And by the fifth year is when farm workers would start receiving overtime pay um, after 40 hours. Um, and so that's uh, how the five-year transition period would look like. And it, it's currently coupled with um, a tax credit that, that um, ranchers and growers will have access to to pay farm workers overtime wages. Um, and so that um, that tax credit will exist for the time of the transition period, whether that's going to be renewed or extended for longer than the five year transition period, it's still up in the air, um, but that um, that tax credit will exist for for industry. Thanks, Ira. Um, got a handful more questions, so we're going to keep going on them for now. Um, Another question is who will oversee overtime to make sure people are rightly comp compensated? Yeah, great question. Um, so the labor agency that oversees a, a wage and hour and hours is the Bureau of Labor and Industry, also known as Bully. Um, so they're the agency in charge of overseeing uh, wages uh, and, um, and they would be the ones overseeing the overtime law. Thanks, Sarah. Um, how will overtime work for peace rate workers? So uh, peace rate workers would also receive uh, overtime um, after 40 hours in a work week. Um, and so uh, with regards to peace rate, um, they're often, often paid by either the bucket or by the pound. Um, and so they would be paid at 1.5 times the rate of how much that pound is worth at um, the first 40 hours, 1.5 times that rate after 40 hours um, once overtime is fully implemented. So they would also be covered under this policy. Does this bill extend to the reforestation workforce and are reforestation workers currently not getting overtime pay? It's uh, my understanding that reforestation uh, workers do get overtime pay. Um, so they they wouldn't necessarily be covered. Um, this is uh, specifically for uh, agricultural workers. Um, but it, my understanding is forestation, deforestation workers already receive um, overtime pay. Great. Um, one more detail about the bill before we get into questions around how to support and um, potential concerns of workers themselves. So. Um, 
this question is, is there any talk of a bill or an extension of this bill to include some back pay for overtime worked in the past 20 years? A way to try and make more right the fact that Oregon has been stealing wages from farm workers for decades. That's, uh, it's not currently not being talked about. I think, I mean, it's a great idea of uh, retroactivity. Um, however, that's um, not on, on the table right now and it hasn't been in, in conversations uh, with regards to this policy. Um, and I think that may be due to like the lack of uh, data and information um, that we currently have access to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it would be great to look at that at some point in the future to make sure workers are fairly compensated for the work they've done in years prior. Absolutely. Um, there are a couple questions along the lines of um, the following, which is, I've heard that farm workers don't want this bill because they rely on working long weekends to make their living. And if it were implemented, then farms would hire more people overpaying someone to work overtime. And that is what happened in California. A uh, similar question is, Opponents of HB 4002 are stating that establishing overtime protection for agricultural workers will reduce their overall take-home pay. Is this a common concern among the among the farm workers that Kuhn works with? Yeah, those are really great questions that we've uh, heard from community members. Um, also, bring those concerns, and I think when talking further around the um, implementation and around the policy and um, what the the what we're ultimately trying to gain what well, farm workers are ultimately trying to gain with this uh, campaign um, is that there, there is a possibility the that farmers uh, will want to limit hours and cap hours it is also our understanding and we've heard directly from uh, these different um, farmers and growers that there is a labor shortage and that um, they need more workers and the context may look different in california i'm not sure if, how their labor workforce looks like in agriculture but at least in Oregon, what we've heard directly from uh, um, industry representatives is that there is a labor shortage and they're even looking to, for ways to incentivize to get more workers uh, into agriculture. Um, we believe overtime is one of those great ways to really incentivize workers may, uh, being retained within uh, the agricultural industry. Um, and it's also just a right uh, that they have um, to, that they should be receiving as every other worker. Um, and so the it, it's a little difficult to accept the fact that the that they're going to contract more hours or that hours are going to be cut because there is already a limited number of workers that are available in the state. Uh, and additionally, um, the work needs to still be done. The crops still need to be harvested, and there's only uh, so much time that that farmers have to to work on the in harvest season. Um, and so we don't think that they'll risk having crops and harvest go bad. Uh, at the expense of not paying farm workers overtime wages. And we do believe that the work is going to maintain and it needs to be um, uh, finished um, so that they can continue, we can all continue with our food systems uh, and making sure food gets into our stores and, and our homes. Great. Um, and I said there was just the one more kind of policy specific question, but uh, there's actually a couple others about um, with wage theft being an issue in this industry, how do we know the money will actually go to the agricultural workers? And then uh, similarly, will there be consequences for those who do not properly pay workers? Great question. Yeah, um, wage theft is always uh, an issue and a concern that we do have um, at Pekun and as farm worker advocates. Um, that's an ongoing issue that we're seeing how we can improve and, and uh, reduce the amount of incidents that occur with regards to wage theft. Um, it, and it's going to require more work uh, with the labor agencies like Boley, like Oregon OSHA, to really ensure the safety, health, and, and um, the uh, dignity with regards to wages for farm workers and all workers um, for that matter. Um, so this bill specifically won't uh, make any changes to Boley's oversight or to OSHA's oversight. Um, however, that is a, a conversation that we are thinking of and are uh, continuing to work with um, partners, stakeholders, and as well as labor agencies. Thanks, Ira. With just a little time left for q and I want to kind of pivot to a couple questions around how best to support. But um, for those who didn't get their questions answered, we'll try to collect them and respond to you either in chat or as a follow-up over email. 
Um, but the, the final question for now uh, is, or there's, there's two of them that are related. One is, um, as a farm worker myself, I'm really glad there are actions being made. How can students like myself have, help advocate for farm worker rights? And then relatedly, what can other institutions such as schools, the Portland Clean Energy Fund, et cetera, do that invest in agriculture to support overtime and farm worker rights? Yeah, great question. And um, that's actually a really great segue into the next slide, which actually covers how people can get involved and support the campaign um, in, in the various different um, hats um, and um, roles that you hold within your organization or within your institution. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so you, you can take action today. Um, and the very first thing you can do is uh, email your, your legislator in support of HB 4002 farm worker overtime. That's uh, one of the, the quickest and simplest ways that you can support with, uh, with this campaign is, is talking to your legislators and making them, making them be aware that, that you're supportive of this policy, that you're supportive of making sure farm workers are paid equally for their work um, and, and that this passes in the 2022 legislative session. Um, so that's one of the first things uh, that you could take action on. Um, if you are part of a, a, a group, an organization, um, or um, other uh, entity, then you can also write, or, or individually as well, it's not uh, just for groups, but you can also um, write and submit a testimony in support of farm worker overtime. Um, that's another way that you can engage with the campaign. And um, this testimony writing will happen during the first week of February, um, when did we have a public hearing scheduled. Um, so we will be following up with participants from this uh, forum uh, to inform you all around when the public hearing is scheduled, um, having some resources on how to write and submit a testimony, uh, and continue to stay engaged with the Farm Worker Overtime campaign. Um, you can also sign up for a lobby day that we'll be having throughout the month of February, making sure we're in constant communication with our legislators and inviting um, our community members, our farm workers, allies, and supporters to join us and making sure um, our voices are heard and, um, and amplified uh, throughout the month of February. Um, there is a website um, that you can find that's uh, here on the presentation. It's www. Oregon farm worker overtime .org. Uh, and you can find more information on the campaign, how to take action. Um, and there's actually a, a, a link to, um, uh, to, to help you contact your legislator on that website. Um, so there's uh, more resources that you can find there. Uh, and as I mentioned, we will be following up via email. Um, so just uh, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, and I will be dropping my email in the chat in case folks have any other questions or um, you want to um, endorse a campaign, then you can uh, contact me and, and we can follow up with you uh, and other folks as well. Um, thank you so much for the time today. Um, and in fact, um, for folks who uh, would like the extra support, um, we will be having a testimony writing workshop as Julia mentioned. Um, and uh, yeah, but thank you so much everyone for, for listening today on Farm Worker Overtime uh, and stay uh, online if you want the additional support on how to write a testimony. That was amazing, Ira, just for the record. <laughs> Not that like there is a record here per se, but uh, oh my goodness, you were amazing. So thank you for answering all those questions and dropping your um, email in the chat for folks to uh, reach out to you directly if they still have questions. Um, but that was incredibly helpful and informative. Um, and I would like to pass it off to uh, Liz, also from Cocoon, uh, to take it away with the training for how to participate and submit testimony on this bill. It's also good training for how to do testimony on other things you really care about. So here we go. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Liz Marquez Gutierrez. I am a political organizer with Pecun. Um, and this is a one-on-one -on, -one on testimony writing. And like Julia mentioned, this is also a great opportunity um, if um, in the future you want to continue to support it and important policies like this, like farm worker overtime um, and supporting your communities uh, to pass important legislation. Um, 
this is a, a great uh, tool for you. Um, so first, um, when writing testimony, um, like I mentioned, there's several ways to support uh, the campaign. Um, right now, we are looking to gather more testimonies in support of farm worker overtime. As we've been mentioning, this is long overdue. And so we're letting our legislators know that it's important for them to pass this policy um, in the 2022 legislative session because we can't wait any longer. Um, and testimony writing doesn't have to be super complicated. It doesn't have to be uh, super long. Um, so one of the first steps um, that uh, when you're writing your testimony is um, starting by addressing who you're writing to. So this bill is going to be going into the um, House uh, Business and Labor Committee. Um, so you'll start by addressing that committee. Um, and then next, you will start by introducing yourself, your name, um, where, what part of Oregon you are from, if you're comfortable with sharing that. But it's also really important for legislators to know um, who, who, who is uh, interested in this issue. Um, we want to demonstrate that it's not just, you know, farm, farm workers from Woodburn, it's um, folks from all over Oregon that care about um, this policy. Um, and the other thing you can do is by writing something very brief. If you're part of a group, if you're part of an organization, if you have your own business that's supporting, um, or if you know you are um, a farm worker or uh, your family's impacted by this issue, uh, you can include that um, in that quick introduction. Um, and then the next step would be to explain why you're writing. So explaining that uh, you're writing because you're in support of farm workers receiving uh, overtime wages um, as soon as possible. I think I saw um, some folks in the chat saying, um, what do we do if we want um, them to pass this in two years instead of five? And you can certainly do that um, because we know that five years is too long for farm workers to continue waiting. Um, so yeah, you, you can go ahead and, and um, explain to them that this needs to happen as soon as possible. Um, and then the next step is explaining why passing um, farm worker overtime pay is important. And we know that be, just because an uh, issue doesn't affect us personally, um, it's not, um, not as important. It's important because um, it affects someone. And um, it doesn't have to be um, like, like your personal story. Um, it could be that you support um, overtime pay because you believe farm workers should be treated with dignity and respect, um, just like every other worker, um, because you believe that farm workers uh, deserve a life that is uh, filled with dignity and respect, that they also deserve um, to spend time with their families for economic reasons, um, like we were mentioning. Um, and yeah, and anything you would like to, to write to your legislator explaining why you believe that um, all Oregonians deserve to be treated equally, um, treated with respect and dignity, um, regardless of their occupation, their, their color of their skin, uh, their immigration status, or the language that they speak. Um, and then the next step is explaining how they can solve this problem, um, right? Because you want to introduce the problem to them, and um, you also want to explain how they can be a part of the solution. So what they can do is they can um, help pass this by voting yes on House Bill 4002. And then if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is an example of what uh, a testimony would look like um, if you want something super simple. Um, so here we have like, you know, step one and it has the names of the members of the House uh, Business and Labor Committee. And then step two, um, you know, I put myself in ex as an example, my name, where I'm from, and my, my organization, like uh, my affiliation, as you would say. Um, and then step three, um, that I'm writing in support of um, House Bill 4002, Farm Worker Overtime. And step four, um, why this issue is important because farm workers are the backbone of our food system and they're essential workers. They've been showing up for us um, despite a respiratory pandemic, the catastrophic wildfires, a snowstorm. Um, they are constantly exposed to heat and pesticides and they continue to put their um, 
health and safety at risk to make sure that not just their families have food on the table, but ours too. And so we need to show up for them um, like they've been showing up for us time and time and again. Um, and then step five is um, the solution where um, it's a call to action to legislators as well to take action and vote yes on House Bill 4002 to make sure that um, Oregon farm workers um, who are skilled laborers um, uh, are paid overtime wages. And then you would just uh, write sincerely or a thank you and you would sign your name. Next slide, please. So I'll stop there. Are there any questions on um, how to write your testimony? Do folks feel that this is something that's um, easy or? We have a question in the chat about the submission process. I believe that's the next section with screenshots and all that stuff that will help you understand how exactly to do it. Yes, that's a great question. Yeah, I think there's two of those. Maybe we should <laughs> jump into the next section. Okay, yes, sounds good. Okay. All right, so this next section is showing you how to submit your testimony on OLIS, also known, uh, and that's like short for the Oregon Legislative Information System. Uh, that's the, um, that's uh, where you find uh, information on bills um, and what's happening at the state legislature. Next slide, please. All right, so some key um, things that you should know before submitting any testimony on OLIS is that this um, is public, like this information will be public. Um, so please uh, be cautious about your personal information, what you're including on your testimony. Uh, don't add any personal information like your address um, because like I mentioned, it's public and it'll be accessible for anyone who does a quick Google search. Um, and then the other thing is um, the testimony uploading time. So um, we will know, uh, we will know, I believe like a couple of days before um, when this uh, bill will have a public hearing. We are expecting something in the first couple of days of the legislative session, which starts uh, February 1st, so next Tuesday. Um, and so we'll have a hearing date and that's when the submission um, to upload your testimony testimony will open. Um, but there's also a closing time when you can submit testimony. So after a bill's been heard, um, after 24 hours, um, you can no longer submit testimony. So there is a window. Um, so yeah, just be mindful of that if you would like to submit testimony. Next slide, please. So uh, what you would like, so what you uh, would want to do is Google OLIS. Um, and if you just um, Google OLS, O-L-I-S, um, it will come up um, and then you would go to the Oregon Legislative Information System. Um, on the upper right hand uh, is um, a circle and it says committee. So you would click on, uh, on on that tab. Um, and once that tab uh, opens up, it says, um, it brings a drop down menu that says like Senate, House, and Joint. And because this is a House bill, it will be heard on the House um, side first. So you would uh, click on uh, where it says House, and then it will have a drop down menu where it, um, it has like the committee for the Business and Labor Committee, and you will click on that committee, um, then it opens up to the picture that you're seeing now. Um, and it will say like House Committee on Business and Labor. And you would scroll down to the bottom where it says submit public testimony, which is what circle in red. And you would click on click to submit testimony. Um, and next slide, please. So once you um, click on click to submit testimony link, um, it will have uh, this, uh, this screenshot that we have here. Um, it'll say testimony submission form and um, it'll have the committee chosen already for you. But um, right here where it's circled in red, you would need to select um, when the bill is being heard. Um, and again, like I mentioned, we don't have the hearing date for this yet. Um, and we'll follow up with you all 
on when that will be so you know. Um, but once you have that information, you'll be able to select uh, the date for the hearing. And once you select the date, a list of all measures, so a list of all bills is going to pop up for you. And um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So once you um, click on the, the date for the hearing, um, this is gonna show up. So what the screenshot, um, like what you're seeing right now. Um, and once you are in that page, um, you will want to um, click next to the bill that you are gonna be submitting testimony for. So it's gonna have like a list um, of other bills, um, but you'll click next to uh, House Bill 4002. And from there, it's gonna expand and it's gonna have like a, a form and you're gonna be asked to fill out your first and last name, your email address. Um, if, you're if you're submitting testimony on behalf of an organization, um, and it's also gonna ask uh, the city of residence. Um, and so some of those um, are, some of those submissions are like required and some of them are optional. Um, and then you will be asked to add your testimony. Um, so you can add your testimony one of two ways. You can either submit um, a testimony through the text box, text box that is showing uh, right here. Um, but it is limited to about 4,000 characters, um, or you can upload a PDF of your testimony. So you would either do one of those two if you're going to be uploading a testimony. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. If you're going to be uploading a testimony, um, you will select your document, document title, um, and then you will have to create your testimony in PDF format um, and add it to the testimony submission form. Uh, by clicking on the upload a PDF button and selecting your file to attach the, to the form. And then you will have to click on um, the CAPTCHA box uh, to verify that you're not a robot. And then you will hit uh, click uh, submit testimony. Um, and then from there, if your testimony has been uploaded successfully, um, you will be taken to a testimony submitted successfully page. Um, and yeah, that is a, a quick run through of what uploading a testimony will look like in for the 2022 legislative session. Are there any questions? I feel like one of the questions that's uh, that's definitely worth uh, answering here uh, in terms of clarifying uh, how testimony works. Uh, should we submit testimony to the committee or to our reps and senators or both? Um, you mentioned that the, it's starting in a House committee, and when it gets a hearing, that first round in that House committee, you'd want to submit comments to that committee mm -hmm. um, during that window of time when the comment period is like happening. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to walk us through like um, once the bill moves, how it would, uh, how we would, would communicate with like the senators? Yeah. Um, so another great way. Um, I believe that um, if a bill like, because this bill might go to the Ways and Means Committee, which is like the budget committee. So folks would need to submit uh, testimonies if they would like to that committee as well. Um, and again, it's it's the, the same process. You would need to go through the same submission form and know when the hearing date is. Um, folks can do that. Um, the other great way um, is yes, continuing to send emails to your legislators with the link that Ira mentioned. Um, also signing up for lobby day so you can directly have, maybe not directly because the session is virtual, but like have virtual um, you know, meetings with your representatives and letting them know that uh, this issue matters to you and, and your community and farm workers as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's really great uh, opportunities um, depending on folks' capacity on uh, how they would like to um, send this message to their legislators. But writing a testimony is um, a great opportunity to expand on how you feel. And to make sure that it's in the record and that they you know, know how many people are willing to go through this, this process with all these different steps to make sure their voice is getting heard. Yeah. Um, something else I was um, going to add here is it's, Rather than you individually having to go into OLIS and like check, uh, you know, whether or not a uh, bill is getting a hearing, if folks sign up um, on your website to get notified um, or sign up for your email list, like I'm assuming that that'll be something you're communicating 
in close to real time to your supporters when the bill is moving? Yes. Um, yeah, we will be doing that. Um, if folks um, are interested, um, we will be sending uh, a notification on uh, when we'll have the public hearing um, and like updates on uh, what's happening during the session. And I can include um, because I saw a couple of folks saying that their organizations would like to support. Um, and I am dropping my uh, email in the chat. Um, if you want to reach out and endorse uh, this campaign and be a part of the coalition, um, it's always great to, to work together to make sure that this is passed, OLCV. Um, there's so many other great organizations that are partnering with us to pass this. So yeah, um, feel free to contact me for additional information. Okay. Um, looking through the questions. Oh yeah, and I think Elizabeth is mentioning something uh, really smart, which is you can sign up in the OLIS system to get notified about when bills are moving. That's another great way to make sure you don't miss your opportunity to get your testimony in on time. Um, we don't have a screenshot for that, so you can like just play around in OLIS for a bit, get really familiar, because it's a virtual session means it's a virtual session. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and the specific question is, will people who are part of this participating in this forum get an email about when um, hearings are happening? That's actually not a terrible idea for us to use this um, registration list for that communications. Um, and that actually reminds me now that we're down to much, much fewer participants than we had to begin with, but this, this uh, presentation has been recorded um, and we'll be sharing that with um, the participants as well so that you can, um, you know, have that information. And also for folks who registered but weren't able to make it, they will be able to watch the, the recording of this. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's reasonable for us to, to um, include this list in that alert. Um, da, da, da. So she, the, someone wants clarity about how long the, um, the submission period will be open after the hearing date. So it, that's the, usually what happens is the hearing, uh, the public testimony time is up until the hearing itself. Um, once in a while, um, legislators who see a need for it will extend the, 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 the period that people can submit comments by about 24 hours, it seldom happens. And that deadline is hard. I've missed my opportunity to submit um, testimony because I was literally like a minute late, like that's how it works. <laughs> so I really urge you um, to, to get your submission, your, your, your comments and not down to the wire because um, if you're a minute late, you miss your opportunity. Um, that's how I recall it being in the past. And, and the thing that's not consistent either is you don't always get two full days of notification. Like sometimes stuff gets scheduled really last minute, which is why signing up for those notifications is really helpful um, because if it's just up to you to check it, you genuinely might miss it because these windows of time can be very short sometimes. It's not, it's not the most um, inclusive democratic system. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings a really great point, uh, Julia, that I wanted to mention. And I'm not sure if this was mentioned, but we are going to be in the short session, which means that uh, this session can be no longer than 35 days. So um, legislators have 35 days to push through um, all the bills that they're going to be passing um, in 35 days. So it starts next Tuesday, February 1st, and ends around the second week of March. Um, so yeah, everything is going to be moving pretty quickly. Um, so just keep in mind that. And again, like Julie was mentioning, it's virtual. So um, th there's that accessibility issue as well. Yeah, I, I found, I remember when I first started doing this, that I was a little bit overwhelmed with how to submit testimony and I had to do it so much that like, it feels like breathing now, but yeah, the initial time doing it, all the clicking through and figuring it out is, um, it's not super intuitive. So um, I really appreciate you, Liz, for, for putting together this tutorial. It's, <laughs> I wish someone had done that for me. <laughs> so it's really good. This is very, very helpful. Um, I think we've run through the questions. Um, we were really efficient today. 
uh, in terms of this was scheduled through 7.30, but um, are there any more? Oh, we got a big question coming up. Mm -mm. Nice, there's an announcement in the chat, um, which is so great. Um, Friends of Family Farmers is having a presentation and Q&A session uh, with uh, Representative Paul Holdley on Friday the 4th from 9 to 10 a.m. So that's another opportunity to bring your questions and learn more about the bill and um, also interact with um, uh, legislator Paul Holby, who is one of the sponsors of the bill. So yeah, great. Um, thank you so much for that announcement, Brittany. I mean, we actually have a little bit of time. Do you want to, I don't know how to give people permission to speak, I don't think. Do you want to raise your hand, Brittany? Ta -da. Give me a second. <laughs> okay, I'm getting there. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, great. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for announcing that. Yeah, we're just gonna do a follow-up. So we're gonna just have a conversation for small farmers so that we can kind of get, dig deep into the bill with um, Representative Holvey to have him be able to kind of dig into like the nitty gritty of what this means for small farmers. And I'm, hoping he can be able to be there for everybody to answer some questions so um yeah it's at 9 a.m next week which is probably going to be go time it's probably going to be the time that we're going to be actually getting our testimonies in so hopefully he'll be able to help us um kind of do some clear guidelines of how small farmers will be able to to write their testimony and and make their voice heard as well Um, someone is asking if it's okay to promote on social as well. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of um, when there's public, when the testimony period is opened and there's like, uh, there's also just a lot of like um, social media posts that uh, I know the Coon and our partners are developing and folks are sharing. Um, so you're definitely welcome to share that stuff on, on social media for sure. Um, I think, if, th th does that answer your question, um, Kimberly? Nice. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think one of the biggest ways where we're going to be able to encourage um, participation is by you know social media and uh, letters to the editor, um, sharing the stories of the farm workers, which um, OJTA, the Oregon Just Transition Alliance, and Pacoon have really done an incredible job of of um, collecting stories and having farm workers who are like um, proudly stepping forward in support of this bill, and it is going to be. Um, really impressive and, and, a, and a big show of force for this session. And I'm really excited about getting this thing over the finish line together. So um, thank you so much, everybody, again, for taking the time uh, to, to get through the training here at the end and for learning about this bill. Um, it's really one of the, the big priorities of the session and we really appreciate you taking the time. So uh, thank you, Liz, for walking us through the, that incredible training. It's really, really useful. And thank you to all of our other panelists for, uh, for your participation and leadership on this. Thank you so much. And hope you all have a really wonderful night.